So what I have to say today is going to sort of follow along what these ladies have been talking about. A lot of it is about communication. Um, am I too loud there? OK. So um, what Barb said is true. I um, have worked with the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer since 1989. I was, uh, it was the first year I was put on as a consultant. And so I was part of the regional field staff for them. And since 2001, I've been doing it independently. That's when they switched to an independent process. So I've probably come to at least 135 or 40 new programs and in the, um, to help them get ready for survey. And probably do about four or five a year in the private sector and you know maybe one or two VAs here and there as they come ready for survey. So um, I'd like you to ask questions if you have any questions as we go along. Hopefully I can change the slides. Right. Okay, how do I change the slides? Up, oh, there we go. So today, first I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the Commission on Cancer and then outline some of the activities that you need to um, get your program ready so that you can get through a Commission on Cancer survey successfully. I wanted to talk about developing a multidisciplinary approach, which is what you've been hearing from everybody up here, and review the successes and challenges um, for completing your survey application record. How many people are interested in, on, in um, having an approved program in this? OK. So how many people are not interested? <laughs> Because there are some that aren't, but more and more VAs are coming on board, and there's no reason why you can't do it. You can do it. You, it's just a matter of working together. You can ask also how many are approved. How many are already approved? Wow, that's great. And that you're only one piece of the wheel, so there's a lot of people here. Now, um, I wanted to show you some of the cancer on, uh, Commission on Cancer member organizations. And you'll notice that over there in the corner is the Department of VA. Um, but there is the Association of Hematology and Oncology that you're, the Avaho group is not listed. And I didn't realize that until I was here today. But you can see over the years they've added lots and lots of groups. And there's a process for doing that. But the VA has, thanks to Rayanne, has been up there for a long time. This is a history of what's happening with the American College of Surgeons over the last hundred years. And um, the Commission on Cancer, the American College of Surgeons was the one that started out. It's real hard to see on this thing. Um, you probably have a better view there. Just a minute. So the, um, in 1913 is when the Commission, or the American College of Surgeons was started up, and in, um, they developed their first standards. And it wasn't for a long time until they um, actually had the Commission on Cancer started. So it really, it says here that it was 1922, but I believe it was really in the 40s before many of the registries actually started. And they were a huge component of the programs. Now you should be able to recognize if you're participating in an accredited program all of these cute little signs like NCDB, which we all love, mm -hmm. and um, the NSQIP, and then the last one that's just come on board is CQIP, which is the um, completeness report that, you're, that you see out there, the quality improvement reports that they've sent you 75 slides of to go over with your cancer committee in your spare time. <laughs> the um, Commission on Cancer published multiple books on standards and the latest one is version 1.2 and it's free on the internet. You can download it, you can email it to your members, you can take pieces of it out and copy it and send it to the different people on your committee. And it's divided up 
as it says on this slide, so that it focuses on quality of care via different performance me metrics and quality improvement. And this one has a lot more um, accountability in QI measures, the genetic assessment and counseling, which wasn't in there before, palliative care services. One of the big changes was increasing clinical trial accrual, um, changing the way that we report prevention and early screening, and then the different studies public reporting of outcomes, and in 2015, patient navigation and distress screening. And this slide is actually wrong as of this week, as you, some of you may know. The survivorship care plan has been delayed and is going to be uh, worked in in different increments. And if you're interested in knowing that, I have that information. But I certainly don't have it memorized yet. They just came out with a change because I believe it was only 20% of the programs even thought they would be to the spot they needed to be to have that work by 20, 2015. So you can interrupt me if you have a question or a concern. So this is a cute little map that is about a year old, and you can see whatever state you happen to be from, how many approved or accredited, that's the better word, accredited cancer programs there are and you can see here in the great state of Oregon there's what 16 Jennifer a lot so that's something to be proud of for the west coast out here and for the for the state of Washington we have about 37 and there's been a big push for some years to get more and more VAs to enter the accreditation process and become accredited. And um, I do know of at least one new VA this year, and I think we'll probably have a couple more in the next couple of years. So we believe, if you're a part of the Commission on Cancer, that quality improvement comes through accreditation. And I truly do believe that. Um, if you build the right group and you go follow the standards and you provide really good data, and that's very important, you're going to have a quality improvement happening in your facility. So what is the value of being an accredited program? The, there's a value to the payers. There's a value to the administrative team. There is a value of the providers because we have all this data that we can give them. And the more data they get and they see, the more tools and structure they have, the better their program is going to be because they're going to improve their care. The people who make policies, we're able to show them, educate them. And the patients, in the end, our veterans, are the ones that are going to really benefit. That reassures them that the information and the, the care that they receive is high quality. And so we have to do a lot of public education to get them, um, to let them know about what we have. And there's a lot of pieces, if you're an accredited program, or even if you're striving for accreditation, that you can put out there so that your patients and your providers know what you're doing and how you're doing it. So there's a lot of other new standards in 2012, and yeah, it's 2014, but some of us are still learning the 2012 standards because they were quite different. There were a lot of changes, and um, some of the changes had to do with the Cancer Committee and ensured multidisciplinary attendance. This year, anybody who went through survey in 2014 doesn't have to worry about attendance because they changed the way they calculate it. They first said in 2012 you had to have 50 percent attendance to pass and 75 you would get commendation, 75 percent for every member. This year you had to appoint alternates and if you appointed an alternate, either one of you could attend. And um, as long as that alternate was appointed at the beginning of the year, and you would get credit for attendance. 
but you have to have 75% attendance, and the attendance is calculated not by the person, but by the position they hold. So if the cancer registrar attended 75% of the meetings, you would meet, whether it was one cancer registrar or her alternate registrar. Same thing with your surgeons, which we know are easy to get attending. And um, some of the other physicians that we have tr traditionally had some problems getting to attend. Maybe not at your place, but at my, mine we do. And that's what this standard is all about. So this year you all get a buy on that one. In other words, you, if you were surveyed this year, that standard was met. But next year, you have to show your alternates and show your attendance. And then there was some significant monitoring of community outreach that was identified as a need and an activity. And so you're supposed to do a, um, some sort of an assessment to see what site of cancer, what kinds of patients have a higher morbidity and need to be screened earlier. And the VAs do an excellent job of the screening and they actually have some um, automatic um, meeting of those, those standards because of the screening that is done in the Veterans Administration. But you still have to look at the needs of your patients and what sites are high. Maybe you need to do some sort of education even if it's just a poster board. Um, and you need to keep track of the numbers of people that go through these screenings so that you can put that in your survey application record. This is a hard one for some of the smaller facilities. They're increasing the clinical trial accruals nationwide for all programs, including the VAs. The um, College of American Pathology protocols and the use of synoptic and pro, uh, reporting changed and um, the, the percentage went up, I believe. So we have to, um, another group, uh, another change was the RQRS program, and that is Rapid Quality Reporting System. And the Rapid Quality Reporting System is really sort of a fun, um, if you like data, I call it fun. Um, you might not think it's fun, but um, it's a way of tracking your patients before they miss the boat before they've missed out on getting treatment. And it's a way of sending your data in early enough to where if they didn't get their treatment, you can notify the physician and say, hey, I, I don't see it in the record. Is he going to get chemo for his stage 3B colon cancer or not? Um, and maybe that will prevent a delay. And so it will compare your performance rate with other accredited programs across the country and over time. And it actually really is helping to get people more aware of what those different performance measures are and how to meet these requirements. So, uh, oh, did I go backwards? Yes. That was me. I am. Okay, so now let's get into preparing for a really successful survey. Um, or a, so in this case, we have no agenda for the meeting, so what on earth are we going to do? It's the day before the meeting. That is the worst scenario that you can put yourself in. Once a year, you need to sit down with the, several key players on the team and um, that would be your cancer committee chairman, your liaison physician, maybe your quality improvement person, and, or whoever is the one, and you all know who they are, that the movers and the shakers in your program that really help to get it going. And if you don't have any, you can create that person by getting them to sit down and really explaining what the standards are that you need to meet and how you need to have an agenda pre-planned and a plan for your year. And that's when you're going to um, sort of talk about your goals for the year, your objectives. Your, um, there's, you have to come up with some clinical and programmatic goals. And you're also going to talk about what kind of studies should we be doing. What, um, you're, you know, we need to look at our cases. And maybe you need to come prepared with data to that meeting. 
but it should be the cancer committee chair for sure that is there and is helping you and maybe it's only going to be that person but you really need to get that so you're going to have an annual planning meeting you're going to assure right off the bat that everybody that is um, is a committed member and that they all have alternates assigned. And that can be all done outside of the cancer committee. It should be done outside of the cancer committee. Don't expect to go to your first cancer committee and sit down and say, okay, who ha who's, who's going to be your alternate, Dr. Jones? And they're like, what are you talking about? Um, you know, so you need to do this all ahead of time with your chair. And um, if you're in a small program, and a lot of people are having trouble in asking the college, what do we do? We don't have except for medical oncologist and, you know, or let's, let's skip not medical oncologist. Let's say two radiation oncologists. One of them is, um, you know, can't make the meetings and the other one is the chair. So I can't expect him to cover for the other one. So if you don't have an alternate, it's okay. But, they, but the person, the member that's required has to attend 75% of the meetings. And it's okay to call in. Barb and I have been calling in to probably five cancer committees across the country for a long time. And, and now they're even encouraging you if you're, you know, your surgeon is on vacation and he can't make it, he can call in and... Um, most facilities have the, the uh, technology to do a conference call in the middle of the room and have a, a speaker phone. And um, I even have one physician that, <laughs> I don't know where he was. I think he was probably on the golf course. But um, he was texting me his comments so that I could say what his comment was because he, he couldn't be heard on the speaker phone. It was really sort of interesting how they really have taken it to heart, at least at one of the facilities that I work at. So it's really important that you have that list of members you have to have that are required for your facility and that they get alternates assigned. And that list is then presented at the first meeting. And you're done. You don't have to worry about it after that. So you're going to choose your dates for the meeting, they have to work with your chairman, they have to work with your liaison physician, and you're going to get rooms, and then you're going to calendar the meetings through Outlook with all of your cancer committee members. And um, this is really important because if they can get it on their calendar in advance, they're probably going to come. You put this meeting on your calendar a long time ago or you wouldn't have been invited to come. And it's the same thing with cancer committee. If they don't hear about it until two weeks ahead of time or maybe a week, they've probably already got patients scheduled or a meeting, some kind of a meeting. So giving them advance notice as much as you possibly can um, is really the way to go about it. Discuss your goals and objectives for the year. Know what's going on in the program. And you lead it. You get the cancer committee chair and liaison, maybe the quality improvement coordinator, to be there to talk about the quality issues, the studies, um, the things that you've been seeing. Maybe you're having an, an increase in pancreatic cancer and you've never looked at it. Maybe this would be a good thing to look at at your facility. Or um, a lot of VAs have a lot of increase in their liver cancers right now. And that would certainly be something that um, would be a good 4.6 um, study. So that's the annual planning meeting. You can see how happy they are. She's the chair, by the way. The cancer registrar is that man next to her. The chair's taking the, I just imagine this when I see, when I see the pictures. Because the chairman is taking the lead. OK. Now, you can't see this because, I guess because I blurred it when I put it on there. And I'm not smart enough or technical -y. I'm technically challenged and didn't know you could just put your Excel sheet in here and then pop it open. But I have a planning grid that I have made. And on that planning grid, it's going to show every standard and what the standard says and what the requirements are. 
and then it's going to have four lines, and you can probably see a bunch of X's, and those are each meeting during the year, and because you're only required to have four, if you have six, fine, put six columns, but I go through systematically after we've had our planning meeting, and I mark when we're going to do what on the agenda. So voila, we've got our agenda for the year. All we have to do is pull it out and okay it with the chairman and send it out. So, um, and if something doesn't get presented because say the nursing person that was, you know, the director of nursing is, didn't get to come because her son got married or something, um, then you need to move that to the next meeting, but you need to make an arrow or something and be sure that that is really important that, that you remind her because you can't skip any of these things. And when it comes to the end of the year, you'll be able to see that you've got everything done. And this is, again, some of the, you know, another way I was trying to play with it. Um, I can't even read it myself. But I also add other people, um, other things that aren't standards. I try to pick out a, um, like the rehab services don't have their own standard really, but there's questions about them in the eligibility requirements. And so I will take and have, at, let them be like their 10 minutes to shine, let them do a little presentation. Um, I encourage them to show the pictures of the people that are actually doing the work on the units and letting um, everybody see what they do and they always get a lot of questions from the doctors because the doctors don't realize you know everything about it or maybe it's the radiation department have them you know show the people that are actually doing the giving the treatments and talk about the quality improvements that they're doing in their department and that can open up a lot of really interesting things but again you have to plan ahead and ask these people to be prepared to come even if they're not members of the cancer committee and then I just sort of jump backwards, but the eligibility requirements, you only have to look at these once a year. Um, there's quite a few of them, what, 12, 14, how many? 12. 12. And um, they should have already been approved by your cancer committee a couple of years ago. And if you're a new program, it's really important that you do look at all of these policies and things. And there's a whole section in your standards manual about the eligibility requirements. And you don't, you can't, as a registrar, you don't create any of these. These are all created by different departments and they have dates when they have approved them. It might be the policy for how they take care of chemotherapy drugs. It might be um, how they do QA because you don't have a radiation center how they, um, what the, where you send it, maybe you send it across the street to all your patients to the university, then you need to have the information about their radiation center in your eligibility requirements so that it's known that you know that they're getting quality care in a good program when you send them out. So there, once you've done it, then once a year, usually in the um, summer is when I do it, um, I just go through them, be sure they're all up to date, and ask the people that aren't up to date to send me the update, and then we present them. And I usually just, in, I can embed them into Microsoft Outlook. I can't do it into to this silly program, but um, you can attach them and then send them out to your cancer committee for approval and just note that. So you don't waste the cancer committee's time reading some of these. Some of them need to go there. Um, so the agenda, you're going to make up your agenda at least two weeks ahead and you're going to share the agenda with the key members so those key members know what to expect. You don't have to send the agenda out to everybody and most places have maybe 35 members anymore, 30 members anyway, and the alternates should be encouraged to come just so they're informed and know what's going on. Um, and you're going to label all the standards on your agenda so like if it's 1.7, you're going to have that in parentheses and, and then your topic so that you can always know what you're talking about. It's also good to put a time on your agenda 
so that you can, the chairman can stay on track. Um, and like I said, you, you want to leave some time, if you can, for a spotlight on such and such department because that really is a nice thing to do and you usually have some time on your agenda for that. And you want to allow the proper time for each agenda item. If you know that it's going to be a hot topic, give it 10 minutes or 15 if necessary. But if you know it's the um, cancer registry quality control and you've done a great job and there's not going to be any problem with it, maybe they only need two minutes and it can be attached to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the minutes. So send reminders out to everyone and that should be a click away and include the agenda and the draft minutes if you want to. It's good to send the draft minutes and every place has a different policy and some places you have to send your draft minutes out a long time ahead of time and get them approved at the meeting and send them on and others you don't. So try to not print all these things if possible and you can let them know so that you have as little paper laying around and as you can. And then your cancer committee meets. Does this look like your cancer committee? <laughs> Notice how nicely dressed they are? Yes, it's something they all look forward to every quarter. And they all show up and they're all smiling. I like that picture. I don't know where the women are, but. <laughs> so when the minutes are really, really important, and the minutes, a lot of you are lucky and you have some sort of administrative person that actually sits there and takes the minutes and types them up, but I would say the majority of people have to do them themselves. And I actually have to say I prefer to do them myself. Um, or maybe have somebody that works with me do them and then I change them. Um, but uh, so um, you don't have to put the whole standard in every set of minutes. You don't have to put, excuse me, you don't have to put every standard in every set of minutes. You only have to put the ones in that you are discussing that were talked about at that meeting. Some people like recreate the book and they might have 40 pages of, for one set of minutes. It really shouldn't go that far. And I know that's hard to change, but um, simplifying your minutes and really just putting the key points, but they have to be enough words in there to where people can read them later, including yourself, and know what you did at that meeting. So again, I really recommend you put the, at least the standard number in parentheses. If you were talking about the CAP protocols, put that number in. If you were, you know, 4.6 was a study done and Dr. Jones, you know, presented it and you've attached it and the topic was and, you know, just, just a few things about it, but, um, it's really hard for the surveyor and they get very frustrated. Now some of them say, may say they really like it, I don't believe them, um, but when they have to read about 50 sets of, well let's see, three years worth times four, they've got to read 12 sets of minutes and confirm it. Now I know Carol's going to say something, go ahead, I think she just went through survey and what I'm saying is in direct conflict with what her surveyor told her. Yes, yes it is. Um, yes, I just went through survey on the third. I think we did pretty good. I have no complaints, which is why I'm here celebrating. Um, no, but my, what my surveyor did say, and yes, I'm one of those people that has those 40-page minutes. However, what she did compliment me on was that instead of having attachments, I had the standard listed I had our discussion, what was being done, and, and things like that, but right underneath that standard, I included the documentation supporting that standard instead of highlighting and saying, you know, go to page uh, two and see attachment 50. I had everything right in order so that she could see everything all at once. 
And I think that's a good point, Carol. Thank you for bringing it up. You can also embed your minutes. That's what I was going to say. Embed the actual report if you, right there. Right. One problem, though, that you don't know about, perhaps, is when you embed things in your minutes, the surveyor can't open the embedded thing in the SAR right no, now. No, actually, he was able to open it. He was, because yeah, a surveyor survey. I had said he couldn't do it. Yeah, we opened so, so he also, I think, said that he couldn't find the... He only found one year of an accession log when they were on an Excel sheet and there were two tabs at the bottom that were labeled. So um, you don't know if you're, what your surveyor is able to do or not able to do, but Carol's point is well taken. The less attachments you can have, the better. If you can put in your text what you did, but you still need to have that report somewhere, actually you put it up on the survey application record, um, it's better. But what I'm saying is there's 35 standards. And this month, we didn't talk about 5.3456 at all. So why put those in your minutes and say, no action, no action, no action? Don't do that. That's a waste of that. In my, that's my opinion. You can do what you want. And maybe your facility likes it that way. And that's the format they've had forever. Um, some people like it with three columns and who's responsible. Other people like text. So um, just whatever works for you. But be sure ahead of the meeting that you don't have any misspelled words and that you're ready and that everything is complete. And ask for help if you need to. You know, if you, it's okay. It's, you don't, it's not all your responsibility. And there you are. It's five minutes till 12, and the copy machine won't work because you didn't do it yesterday when it was working. So you're sitting there at your desk, and it's the day before cancer committee. And my desk looked like that sometimes before I burned it. But um, it's just, you know, we don't need all this paper and stuff. We need to try to be more organized and prepare ahead of time. And we won't look like that. But it does make us look busy when the administrating people come around. So here's a, a, a cute little cartoon. Who do I hold accountable if you miss the deadline? Do you have any next of kin? <laughs> Sometimes you feel like that. But the, and it, it's still, it's starting to shift in most places. I don't think the registrars are um, being blamed for all of the problems in the facility anymore. You're not able to take care of all of these things, of all of the standards. You absolutely can't be responsible for all of them. That's why preparing and having that group at the beginning of the year to talk about the standards really helps. So you don't look like this. So you're going to sit down and you're just going to relax and you're truly ready for your survey. You're going to be truly ready for your cancer committee. Now I haven't talked a lot about how you actually prepare for the survey because if you prepare for cancer committee, you are prepared for survey. You can still come to Avaho even though Tuesday you're going to have a survey at your facility. Wendy knows about that. <laughs> because if you're prepared and you've been doing it all along, you don't, you don't have to have that crunch time. Yeah, you're going to be a nervous wreck and yeah, you're going to have to put in a few extra hours along the way. The serve, but you should be relaxed a little bit. So when I talk to a new program and they want to get, in, they want to get you know, up and running and I've reviewed them and I think they're ready to go. Well, I tell them, okay, now it's going to take you a minimum of 60 hours to complete the SAR from start to finish. That's when you haven't been using it and you're not accredited currently. If you're accredited currently, you should be putting your minutes up there as soon as they're approved. You should be, uh, there's, there's a place where you, if you're not accredited, there's a place where you can put all documentation. You can put your studies in there. You can put your accession log in there. You can put just about anything. You're putting how many um, 
OCNs the nurses told you they had for this year, what your cancer conference, how many people were seen, how many people were discussed, staged, everything. You can put your grid up there at the end of the year. And every year, and I believe, and it's, they've changed it every now and then, we have till the 1st of November to update your, what they're now calling, it's a brand new word, the PAR. That is the program application record. And that's what you do between survey years. And then everything that you put in that will be uploaded to your survey application record the year of survey. But it really is going to take you a long time. And one program that I just worked with in California told me, you said it was going to only take me 60 hours. I've spent 80 so far. So, you know, it takes some longer than others. But um, so you're going to load all your minutes as soon as they're approved. And, you know, if something happens and you need to have an addendum for a set of minutes or you loaded the wrong set twice or something, you can delete them and take them off. It's not there for the rest of your life or their life. The only time that you can't change what you put in the SAR is after you have had a survey and you send in your evaluation of the surveyor and the survey itself. Once you click that button that you're done and your evaluation is done, you can no longer change anything that's in there. And that's the only time. And that's there for history, and it moves down to the historical line. So um, it's OK if, you, if you're hesitant to put stuff in the SAR because you want to you wanna be sure everything's perfect for your survey. You'll get the opportunity to fix something that maybe the misspelled word or the, you know, you put the wrong number in, you know, whatever. So create a grid for your three-year cycle just like you did for your yearly um, meetings so that you know that during 2014 you met all of the standards because you saw them all. And try to look at that thing about this time of year because if you miss something, you sure as heck better get it in in the last quarter of the year. And then you will have met for that year and you can breathe easy. And if you know that you're not going to meet some standards, and we all know that happens, um, we need to get help. You need to get your, your cancer committee chairman. If he or she isn't the person, then, you know, there might be a nursing coordinator or a, um, the cancer liaison physician, somebody in the facility. Um, I think that um, everybody knows who that champion is for the registry. Maybe they can help you to get that one standard or two fixed before the end of the year. And now, one thing about the SAR that I just learned, and I left this sort of blank because I'm hoping that some of you will tell me your secrets about the SAR, but um, I learned that if you're using Internet Explorer, you don't have spell check. And if you're using Mozilla Firefox for your, you know, your internet, um, you do have spell check. So that's something the college just told me the other day because I found that very odd that I would be in it one day at one desk and be able to do spell check and at another desk I wasn't. Yes. Wait, wait, just a minute. She's going to bring you that. Oh, okay. Oh. We're not allowed to use Mozilla Firefox at the VA. Oh, okay. It's not approved. It's not approved. Oh, okay. So at, that might be a problem then. Um, I would talk to the college and say, you know, this is ridiculous. But it's automatic in um, Mozilla Firefox. And I use that from home on the SAR. Um, at one facility I, I, that I work at, we have to use Internet Explorer through Microsoft Office. And um, so we don't, which is the same as what the VA does. And so that's where I would be when I couldn't use it. So if you go home and you enter something, say you're working from home, you can, you're not, you're, the SAR is stored on the Commission on Cancer website. So it's not on your VA website at all. You're not on a VPN when you're doing it. So you might be able to do spell check on what you've entered previously. And that would maybe help. Maybe not. Donna. Honey, I was asked if these slides are going to be available for everyone. 
Oh, absolutely. And in fact, if you would like to have um, the grid, I, I, could, I would email you a copy of my grid, but I didn't put it on there. But I would be happy to email you a blank copy. I have one for veterans hospitals, and I have one for hospitals that aren't, you know, that are all the different categories of hospitals. And I share those with people all the time. So, and then the surveyor comes, and this is my last surveyor, and he was really cool. We liked him a lot. Um, I don't know, your surveyor might be different. You might be lucky and get one of the women that is now surveying programs. And after the survey, this is what I always do. <laughs> Sometimes before Two. the survey. <laughs> And the day after the survey, you absolutely have to have a day off, at least one, you know? Uh, it's very, very important. Now, this is my contact information, and there's my email. And seriously, if, you, if there's anything I said you disagree with, I'd like to talk to you, because maybe I'm wrong and you're right, or if you have some good ideas that you want to share.